Good morning. Welcome to Flagler County Baptist Church. So glad that you are here today on this wonderful Mother's Day. Let's get started by finding a hymn book there. There should be one in the seat pocket there in front of you. Turn with me, if you would, please, to page number 457. 457. And we'll stand together and we'll sing, To God be the glory, great things he hath done. Let's all stand. Let's sing from the bottom of our heart as unto the Lord with all of our might. 457. To God be the glory. Here we go. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. That's why we came here to church today. You say, well, it's Mother's Day. We came to honor our mothers. And I say, oh, yes. But we most importantly came to praise the Lord. You know, and we will certainly do our best to honor mothers today. I see some visitors here for the first time. God bless you. Thank you so much for being a part of our service today. We hope that you uh, enjoy it and hope that you're made to feel welcome. Everyone, thank you so much for being here in the Lord's house. We had such a wonderful time yesterday at the Mother's Day brunch. And uh, the gentleman... They stepped up to the plate, and they, I, think, I think they knocked it out of the park. You know, they, it was really good. They did a great job, and the ladies really, uh, I hope they felt very special because they certainly were. And uh, some people were asking about the, uh, what are they, the four flamingos, right? Yes. The four flamingos. Now listen, let me tell you about the four flamingos. They made their debut here. And, uh, and they're done, okay? And, uh, and I told Brother Jeremy, I said, look now, I said, uh, you go on uh, Facebook. I told my son Simeon, I'm sorry. I said, you go on Facebook and uh, you delete that today. I said, so anybody who wanted to see it, you better get, and look, get to looking because they're deleting it today. And you say, why would you do that? Because I got too much of my past that people can blackmail me with. They don't need one more thing. 
And uh, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, good, you know. <laughs> but uh, we had, a, we had a, a quartet up here that were lip singing, and I was part of the lip singing group. And my wife, she did tell me yesterday, she said, you know, you got some moves. And uh, we were doing a little bit of things you probably shouldn't do in the church house. So we're going to delete, we're going to delete that real quick. But, uh, but anyways, it was a good time and, uh, and good food and good fellowship. And man, I tell you what, what a blessing it was. And so I uh, hope you ladies felt special. We're going to try to do some more of that today and, and just let uh, the ladies and mothers and everyone know how, how thankful we are for them today. But let's start things off right. And I know people have a lot of things on their heart today. Uh, there was a request this morning in the early service from uh, Mrs. Linda Thompson for her former pastor's wife. Her name is Hunt. Um, uh, I'll tell you her, her first name here. It was Gail Hunt. And, uh, and she had a heart attack and has to go in for some major surgery. We're praying for Doug Fisher, uh, Pastor Doug Fisher. And then we're also praying for Brother Alberto. And I know there's many other requests, but uh, uh, those are, all of them are of supreme importance, but you know how that goes. Uh, there's some people whose lives are on the line right now. And your, your brother, what's his name, Jake? Not Jacob. John Paul. John Paul. And uh, praying for him. And so lots of prayer requests, but let's do this today. Let's bow together and we'll pray for these uh, requests. We'll ask God to just bless us in a special way here at the church service today. Father, how we sure love you. Thank you for loving us and being so good to us. Dear Lord, we thank you for this church and thank you for a place that we can meet. We thank you, dear Lord, for cushion seats and air condition and all the things that we get to enjoy. Father, most importantly, we thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. We ask you, dear Lord, that you'll work in our hearts, dear Lord, would you do us a favor? Father, would you speak to our hearts today? How I pray, Lord, that you'll go row by row and person by person and you'll speak to the hearts of people. Father, we pray that you'll just move in a mighty way. Father, today we're going to attempt to preach the word of God. And Father, I pray that you'll uh, bless me and help me, dear Lord, to have the spirit of the Lord upon me as I preach. Father, I pray that you'll use the service today. May you be honored and glorified in it all. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Now here, I need you to get your hymn books out, but if you did not get a bulletin, you're going to have to have a bulletin for this next song. And uh, so is there anybody that doesn't have a bulletin? All right. Miss Kimmy doesn't have a bulletin uh, there. Uh, uh, Brother Melanowski, would you do us a favor and, and, and usher that for me? The ushers are, are gone. And, uh, and so if you would grab those uh, bulletins there. And, uh, and make sure they have one. So keep your hand high because you're going to need a bulletin for this song. All right. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to turn your hymn book uh, to page 191, 191 in your hymn book. And then you're going to have your bulletin out and the back side of your bulletin. There's some verses that I wrote a couple of years ago uh, to, to this song. I added some verses to this song that's in our hymn book there and kind of geared it toward mothers. And so uh, you'll, you'll see them in just a moment. We'll get to them. But we'll start it off by just doing the way that it was originally written there. 191, the first verse in the chorus. And then we'll try to sing some of these that I wrote a couple years ago. And I hope it'll be a blessing to you. But let's try and sing 191, the first verse, as it's originally written here. Here we go. When upon life's pillows you are tempted tossed when you are discouraged thinking all is lost count your many blessings name them one by one and it will surprise you what the lord has done count your blessings name them one by one count your blessings see what god has done I like the way Joe Arthur sang it. He sang, count your many blessings, name them ton by ton. And I said, isn't that the truth? If we started counting our blessings and we got honest about the whole thing, we got so many blessings. We'd have to count them by the ton load, wouldn't we? God has been awful good to us. All right, now look in your bulletin there. On the back of your bulletin, it says, count your blessings, Mother's Day verses. Like I said, uh, <laughs> hope I didn't plagiarize anything. I wrote this myself, or not plagiarize, but do injustice, I guess, to the original writer here. But I just wanted to give us some song here about mothers. And so you're going to try and sing it with me. It's to the tune of count your blessings, and then we go to the chorus there. But we'll do that that first verse that we wrote there. She's the one to feed you and put you to sleep. Think about the words and maybe it'll speak to your heart as we sing. 
Ready? Here we go. She's the one to feed you and put you to sleep. She's the one who prays that his word you'll keep. She loves and protects you and gives good advice. When you count your blessings, you should count her twice. Count your blessings, name them one by one. And count your blessings, see what God has done. So count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, God has done. Now some folks in here, <clears throat> your mother is still with you. And you say, man, thank the Lord, I still got my mom here. Others of you, uh, your mothers have gone on to glory. And, uh, and for some, Mother's Day is, is so difficult, you know. And, uh, and so this song here, this verse I wrote is for those who maybe your mother's not with you anymore. But she's in heaven, and there's going to be reunion day, and we're looking forward to it. Let's sing about the song. As she's saved, she's with the Lord. Let's sing this verse. Ready? Here's how it goes. If your mother's gone on to the street of gold, remember how her love has made you strong and bold. Just keep on serving Jesus till the time draws nigh. Reunion day with mother in our home on high. So count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God had done. And count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God had done. Go to page 91, would you please? Let's continue singing about this uh, reunion day with mother, reunion day with the Lord, reunion day with all those who knew Christ as Savior who's gone on before us, and all those who are saved with us today. What a day that'll be. Jesus is coming soon. Let's sing about it. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. And what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be the second verse. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness nor pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. Amen. Oh my, what a day that's going to be. Maybe you're like me. You're so looking forward to that day when you see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. And then those loved ones that have gone on before. And uh, man, I'm looking forward to that day. Be sooner than any of us think, I believe. I believe we're not living in the last days anymore. I think we're living in the last minutes. And uh, any moment now, the Lord's going to break through that eastern sky. And uh, he's going to say, come up hither. And, uh, and we're going to be caught up out of here in a moment in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And uh, what a day that's going to be. 
And uh, you say, you believe that? Oh, I believe that as sure as I'm standing here today. You say, why? Because God's never lied yet. Yeah. You know, he said he's going he to come the first time, and he did. <laughs> you know, he said he'd be born of a virgin. He was. Said he'd live a sinless life. He was. Mm. Said he'd be crucified. He was. Said he'd rise again on the third day. He did. Mm. You know, and uh, he's always done what he said he's going to do. And uh, so no reason to doubt him yet. And uh, well, praise the Lord, man. Looking forward to that day. Well, again, like I said a moment ago, we're so thankful for mothers and, uh, and how, how God has, has blessed us in this world. And when I wrote those verses, when you count your blessings, you should count mama twice. And uh, I meant it, you know, thank the Lord for mothers. And so my wife and I, we have a, a few things we want to give you. And, and you know, we, 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 we always do this. We, we, we don't just give the gifts to, to mothers. We give it to all the ladies. And, uh, you know, there's some ladies that God, you know, said, I don't, you know, don't want you to have any children because I want the whole world to be your children, you know, almost in a way. And uh, there's so many that have impacted other people that were not their children, and God used you in another way, and we're so thankful for that. And so we just go across the board, and, and, uh, but, but thank the Lord for it. And so we got a little gift, and we'd like to get that to you now. And uh, Brother Malinowski, you mind helping me again? you don't mind here and uh, I'm missing Dave and Brian and these guys here and uh, so you can help me here if you don't mind and Lisa you're gonna have to help me too sweetheart and uh, it's this one here right all right brother Frank oh maybe that is kind of heavy and I'm glad you're strong all right I'm gonna follow it'll get lighter as we do this I promise all right and so I'll, I'll do this side of Lisa you can do that side there uh, on this side of the aisle here and uh, God bless you happy Mother's Day and uh, all of you now. All of you. Here we go. Go down. You got it, sweetie. Caroline, bless you. Happy Mother's Day. Glad you're here today. Me, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. It's getting lighter, a little bit, little by little. As your arms get more and more tired. See you, cake. Wonderful. There's a there's a few extra. If, if you know of somebody, and I know we need to set some aside for like Mrs. Karen, and and I saw Brother Art here, but I don't know that I see Linda Cooper here. We need, we need, she's not here today, so set one aside for, for some folks there like that, and we want to make sure we do that. Now, she told me I could do something else here. I want to do something. Uh, yesterday, we, we, we um, Brother Roth did a tremendous job with so much. Uh, such a huge blessing, he and his wife and children. And, uh, and he one of the things he did was he gave out some presents for uh, different, uh, what would you call it, characteristics of mothers and stuff. So I'm going to kind of go forward with that and, uh, and, and ask you this. We did this this morning. It's kind of interesting. I want to do it here. All you mothers here, I want you to think about something. Your children that you gave birth to, all right, the ones you've birthed in this world. Were, were any of them born out of the state of Florida? Anybody give birth out of the state of Florida? All right, very good. Some of you gave birth. Okay, so with that being said, I want to see, just for fun, I'll give you a little prize here. Uh, I've never done this one before except for in the 830 service. Who had given birth to a child the furthest from where I'm standing right now? All right, and so how we're going to do this is, did anybody give birth outside of the country? Let's just start there. Anyone outside of the country? You did? Gave birth outside of the country? I think I, think I don't have to go much further because if you, if you tell me it was Scotland then I'm sure you've beaten everybody. Yeah. You gave birth in Scotland to which yeah. child? Yeah, to my oldest boy. Oh, I didn't, was that Kevin? No. Uh, no, Maude. Ma Maude? Yeah, Maude. Oh, my he goodness. Away, uh, and you gave birth in Scotland, did you? Huh? You gave birth in Scotland. <laughs> you did? 
Well, then you win. I, I, in the orderly service, we, we did that. And nobody was outside the country. Then I said, all right, outside of the continental U.S., like Alaska, Hawaii, nobody's there. Then we started working our way from Washington, and we got as far as Colorado, and she was the furthest west. And I'm like, I can't give you a present, you know. And uh, so I skipped her, and I ended up giving it to, uh, uh, was it Betty that got that one from Kansas? She had uh, given birth in Kansas. But Scotland wins that one. And so, honey, would you, Elisa, would you come here and, uh, and give her this? God bless you, Scotland. Scotland wins the day. Isn't that neat? And uh, congratulations on that. All right, now for this next one. Here's, you're going to have to do your math skills. Are you ready? Get ready now on your mind. Here's what I want you to do. How many children did you have? Mothers? Mothers, how many children did you have? Count them up, you know? And uh, just, just, just your children. Now, not the neighbor's kid that, that never left your house and he was always there eating your food. You know, I'm talking about your children. You didn't have to necessarily give birth to them, but you adopted them, whatever. Your children. All right? You got that number in your head? I want you to add now. Do you have any grandchildren? Add those two numbers together. Grandchildren and children. Add that number together. Carry the four. All right. You getting that? Children and grandchildren. I'm giving you a little bit of time because some people, they don't even know how many grandchildren. They got to they gotta add up their grandchildren. All right. So if you got the children and grandchildren, now did you have any great-grandchildren? Add that to the number. Great-grandchildren. If you have any great-grandchildren, add that up. So now it's the children. It's the grandchildren. And it's the great grandchildren. I'll go a step further. If you're super old and you got great great grandchildren, <laughs> I'm just kidding, sort of. Uh, but but add that number, okay? Add that number, okay? Did I give you enough time to do it? I hope I did. All right. Uh, is anybody? We'll start here. Does anybody have? When you add all that together, from you, you have overpopulated this earth, and you've made Bill Gates mad at all of us. How many of you would say, I, had, I have, when I add them all together, I have 20 or more? Is there anybody like that, 20 or more? There's one? When you add it all up, 20 or more? Nobody else has more than 20? Wow. What's your total? 19, 18. All right, 20. All right, now I'm just curious, just for fun. 20, how many? 78. What? Wow. What? Listen. <laughs> listen. I believe her. And here's why. Because one day when I was a kid, I said to my grandma, I said, Grandma, how many cousins do I have? And she says, well, get out a pencil. Let's figure it out. And so she started going one child at a time and how many kids they had. And I started writing it down for her and tallying it up. And by the time we were done, my grandma had 75 grandchildren. And then when we did added the great-grandchildren and great-greats and everything, she, it was over 125 cousins that I had. But my grandma had 12 kids. There wasn't a lot to do back then. you know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, 78, you said? My goodness. Well, praise the Lord. Let me bring this over to you. You win the day on that one. How many kids did you have? Children. 13 children? Well, that's why. There you go. Happy Mother's Day. 13 children. Wow. That is a big grocery bill. That is a big grocery bill. That takes a lot. Well, praise the Lord. Man, that's neat, man. That's really, really neat. All right, so we did the presence there for the mothers. We did all of that. Man, praise the Lord. What a, what a great thing. All right, well, let's look over a couple of announcements. Can we do that real quick here at the church? And uh, in your bulletin, uh, let's see here. We're going to be here back in the Lord's house at 630. And uh, if you'll come back tonight, I'm going to be preaching on this series that I'm doing on overcoming, uh, being an overcomer, living a victorious life, all of this. We're going to try to tackle this thing of overcoming pride, overcoming pride. Now, I can't think of a better qualified person to preach on pride than myself, and so I'm going to preach that. You'll get that in a minute. I'm only kidding. Uh, after having lived with my wife for as long as I have, I've learned a thing or two about pride, and I'm going to preach on it tonight. I'm kidding. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, but if you come back tonight, we will talk about overcoming pride. If you remember last Sunday, we preached on anger. And, uh, and, and, and then we talked about joy and things like that. You know, when you take the Word of God, it's a light, and you shine it into your life. Sometimes you, th you don't think you have a problem with something. And then all of a sudden you take this Bible, though, and you start looking at it, and it shows you yourself, and you say, maybe I didn't realize I did, you know? And I think what we'll find out is that all of us have a problem with the giant of pride uh, at some areas in our lives. And, and the Lord's going to, if you'll come back tonight and we preach the Bible, the Lord will reveal that to us. And I think it'll be interesting. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're always trying to draw closer to the Lord and be more Christ-like. 
And, uh, and sometimes it means confronting some things in our lives that, that we're a little uncomfortable with. But this thing of pride, I think, man, if the Lord will help us with that tonight, it'll, it'll be a blessing. I'll see you then. All right, and then let's look at a couple of other announcements here. We have men's prayer breakfast this Thursday right here at the church. My wife said she's going to have some waffles with some fruit on them and, and some kind of an egg souffle or something or other. And, uh, and then obviously there will be bacon and all God's people said, amen. amen. And, uh, and so we'll enjoy ourselves with that. And uh, but that's this Thursday. But most importantly, we're going to fellowship and pray. We're going to spend some time in prayer. And there's a lot to be praying for. And so we look forward to seeing you this Thursday. Men, men's prayer breakfast at 9 a.m. right here in the kitchen at the church here. Uh, ladies Bible study begins Tuesday, June the 1st. There's a sign-up sheet on the back table. Uh, if you take the time to go back there and sign up to that, uh, we sure would appreciate that. The reason why we need you to sign up is because there's a book that we've got to purchase. We want to make sure that we have enough. Uh, to be able to give you. Uh, also, coming up here really soon is our church-wide picnic. We have reserved the uh, pavilion over at what's called Old Dixie Park. If you were to leave here this morning, you go up to US-1, turn left, you go down uh, and between here and 95, there's a roundabout. You go around that roundabout over there where the old White Eagle used to be. Uh, and you go around that roundabout, and you'll be, if you go left there, you'll be on, on Old Dixie and uh, Old Dixie Highway. You take that road like you're going towards 95 that way. On your right-hand side, there will be a brown sign that says Old Dixie Park this way. And maybe it says something about horseshoes because that's what that particular park's known for. We'll go there. We're going to have a wonderful time. As I said a moment ago, we've got the pavilion to ourselves. So we're going to have a cookout. It's going to be tremendous. There's a basketball court, tennis court, pickleball court, volleyball court, horseshoe pit. There's fishing in the pond. There's a field out there where we can play football, softball, whatever. We're going to enjoy some time of fellowship there. And uh, there is a sign-up sheet on the back table for food. If you could help us out with that, that's there. Uh, I added a couple slots. I didn't check to see if they got filled up, but I noticed that we forgot banana pudding slot. And so that I added that out of my own discretion there. And uh, so hopefully didn't get in too much trouble for, for changing the sign-up sheet. But uh, we're looking forward to a good time on that particular day. Also, another activity coming up here pretty soon is the Jubilee Club is going to be going to the Alligator Farm uh, over in St. Augustine, Florida. That's going to be on June the 10th, Thursday, June the 10th at 10 a.m. We'll be right here at the church. We'll jump on our shuttle bus. We'll head up that way to the Alligator Farm. Jubilee Club is those people who are age 50 and above. Uh, in the Bible, a Jubilee was every 50 years. So if you're 50 and above, you can be part of the Jubilee Club. We're going to go over to the Alligator Farm in St. Augustine. And then after that, we're going to shoot over to Osteen's in St. Augustine and have some fried shrimp or whatever you want to order from there. But we're, that's their, what they're famous for. How many have ever eaten at Osteen's in St. Augustine? Can I see? Several of you have. Wonderful. In the, in the morning services, the majority of people had. And uh, I'm telling you something, they have delicious, delicious shrimp. And uh, so uh, there's a long line to get into Osteen. So, so what we'll do is we'll go to the alligator farm first at 10 a.m. We'll leave the church. We'll head that way. We'll go to the alligator farm first. So eat a late breakfast so you don't get too hungry. And because uh, we're going to have a little bit later of a lunch so that we can avoid the lunch rush and get into the Osteen's restaurant and enjoy a time of fellowship there. And uh, you see the cost for that and all that. June the 10th, look forward to seeing you there at that. Mission Strip Fundraiser. We need some help with some items for our silent auction. If you have some items or services to donate, please see myself or Brother Marco. And uh, we're working on things for our silent auction to raise money. I was speaking to uh, a, a gentleman who's a county commissioner here. And he says, go ahead and put me down for I'm coming and I'm bring some guests with me. And he says, and put me down for a donation. He said, uh, uh, a voucher, you can make a voucher and people can bid on it uh, to go on a ride in my Ferrari around the Daytona 500 track, one lap. And I said, man, you want to go in Commissioner Mullins's Ferrari, one lap around the Daytona 500, you can bid on that. That's going to be pretty cool. And uh, so I'm working on stuff uh, there. And if you have some items that you think would fetch some money there and help send these teenagers to New Mexico so that they can go work with the Navajo Indians. So help us send the teenagers and some adults over there uh, to work with the Navajo Indians. That would be a tremendous blessing if you could help uh, donate some items to that. And uh, definitely plan on coming uh, to that. I don't have the date on there. It's a little ways out. It's going to be July the 2nd. Uh, is the night of the spaghetti dinner fundraiser and silent auction. So make sure that's blocked out in your calendar. You already plan on coming to that and uh, help us. We need volunteers to help us on that night. Trust me, we are going to need. It's going to be a lot of 
moving parts there. Uh, but anyways, we're looking forward to that. And uh, Cleaning Ministry, thank you for Team C. You're going to be helping us this week. We are such a blessing there. Uh, birthdays today, uh, we have John Raym. He's not here today, but his birthday is actually today. And so if you're watching, John, happy birthday, Johnny boy. Uh, Anya Malinowski has a birthday in a couple of days and uh, Marcella Howard's not here today, and uh, so happy birthday to Marcella Howard, but Anya is here, and, uh, and so we're going to sing happy birthday to Miss Anya, uh, 19, right? 19 years old again, <laughs> wonderful. All right, let's sing happy birthday to her, ready? Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you. Amen. Now, Brother Frank, I'm going to give you some marriage advice. Because her birthday is so close to Mother's Day, it does not give you an excuse to merge them together and say, this is for both. Doesn't work. You got to keep the gifts separated. It's going to cost you more money, but uh, you can't go. You got, I'm trying to help you on that one. And uh, you're welcome for that free advice. Uh, that's the, my birthday is so close to Christmas and you get ripped off, man. You know, everyone's like, uh, this is for Christmas and your birthday. And you're like, but if my birthday was in June or something, you'd have given me two things. You know, not fair. But uh, anyways, you ever think about the word not fair? Kids say that all the time. That's the worst English ever. Not fair. Think about it for a minute. Not fair. That is not fair. You know, anyways, whatever. All right. Well, no fair, they say. No fair. No fair. Uh, let's see here. This week, let's just talk about it. Today, 6 o'clock, I, I put an asterisk there beside it so that you ladies would know I moved the time from 6.15 to 6 o'clock, ladies' prayer meeting here at the church. Uh, soul winning, uh, Tuesday at 6.30, Wednesday night service, 6.30 here at the church, men's prayer breakfast Thursday at 9 a.m., and Flagler County Bible Baptist Institute here Thursday night, 6.30 p.m., Dr. D. Keith is teaching the book of Daniel. So that's what's going on this week, and uh, pray for the men tonight. we got two men that are going to the juvenile prison tonight. Uh, and they're going to be preaching while we're in church. They're going to be preaching uh, to the young ladies. And, uh, and, uh, and, and you pray that there'll be some souls saved. Last time they went, there were eight people that trusted Jesus as Savior. And, uh, and so they're going tonight to preach to the ladies. And so you pray for Brother Marco and Brother Elijah as they go there to preach to the young ladies there. All right, well, that's all for our announcements. There are some two choruses right there in your, in your bulletin there. The sun's coming up in the morning, and then the chorus, Going Home. We're going to sing The Sun's Going Up, Coming Up, and then we'll go right into Going Home. Are you going a little higher than you did this morning? If you could, that'd be great. We'll sing The Sun's Coming Up in the Morning, and then, and then it, it, the key works perfectly for us to sing right to Going Home there. So the words are right there in your bulletin. Let me ask you to stand with me. Would you stand? We'll greet one another here in just a moment. But let's sing these two great choruses this morning. The sun's coming up and then going home. Ready? Here we go. Cause the sun's coming up in the morning. And every tear will be gone from my eye. And this old clay is gonna give way to glory. Cause I'm going home, I'm going home, there is nothing to hold me here. Well, I've caught a glimpse of that heavenly land, praise God, I am going home. Brother Jeremy's going to keep playing, would you say hello to somebody nearby? Let them know how glad you are they're here this morning. I thought you looked so
don't understand But I'm standing on a solid foundation And I'm holding to an unchanging hand Would you help me sing the chorus? The sun's coming up Cause the sun's coming up in the morning Every tear will be gone from my eye And this old clay is gonna give way to glory And like an eagle I'll take to the skies Gold wing hope I'm going home There is nothing to hold me here For I come of that heavenly land Praise God, I am going home Thank you for standing. Please be seated. The quartet's going to sing a song about grace and... Um, I'm so thankful for God's wonderful and marvelous grace. And uh, it is something that I think we say often, but I don't know how often we're thankful, truly thankful for God's amazing grace. And you see tons of songs in your hymn book about God's grace, but it's what gets us through things in this world. And uh, Paul, when he had a thorn in the flesh, he besought the Lord thrice that the Lord would remove it from him. But God didn't remove Paul's thorn, but instead God said this to him. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Aren't you so glad that God's grace is sufficient? And uh, no matter what we're going through, God's grace is sufficient. And, uh, and, when, and when we let ourselves get overwhelmed with things in life, you know, sometimes, you know, people, well, they won't even come to church on, on days like this because they just get so upset. And I say, you're telling the whole world that God's grace isn't f sufficient, and it is sufficient. You know, God's grace is sufficient for all of us. You have to trust God's grace. God's grace is sufficient for me. And then you know what Paul said? He said, most gladly will I rather therefore glory in mine infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He said, you know what? God's grace is sufficient. God's grace will help me. And uh, trust God's grace in, in your life. God is good to you. And, he's, and listen, you're trusting his grace to save you. <laughs> you know, you can trust his grace to keep you. And uh, that's what this song's about. And uh, on Mother's Day, I thought it would be absolutely appropriate considering that uh, mothers, you have to have a lot of grace to put up with what you put up with. And uh, we know that to be true. And so listen to this song as we sing. It's entitled Grace. prison, locked up in my chains, sin held me captive to sorrow and pain, tears of frustration as love passed me by, until the master he heard my heart's cry for grace marvelous grace I needed grace to pardon and make me whole grace marvelous Marvelous grace I was downhearted Broken inside Praying for 
your mercy with nowhere to hide but there was a soulless searching for me grace ever flowing that set my soul free for grace marvelous grace I needed grace to pardon and make me whole grace marvelous grace flows from above within Marvelous grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin for grace marvelous grace I need grace to pardon and make me whole grace marvelous Grace. Amen. Praise the Lord. Did I hear Brother Brian? There you are. I was missing you earlier this morning. I was looking for my usher. You were hiding from me. All right. You did? Well, at least you snuck in. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, let's get our Bibles this morning and turn with me, if you would, to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. And uh, look with me, if you would, at chapter number three. Genesis, the book of beginnings. Genesis chapter number three. And we're only going to read one verse of scripture for our text this morning. And then we're going to be looking at lots of scripture here this morning. And what we're going to do today is we're going to make a commitment together this morning. We're going to determine that the Bible is going to be the word of God. And we are going to just take the Bible for what it says and, uh, and let the Lord use it and, uh, and change us. Oftentimes, you find people wanting to change the Bible. And I say, we don't need to change the Bible. Everyone's looking to change the Bible. They say, well, I need one that's easier to understand. And I say, well, how come your great-grandmother with a third-grade education had no problem understanding the King James Bible, but you with your college degree say you can't understand it? You know, there's something wrong with that, that theory. You know, what we, what we don't like is we don't like the potency of the Word of God, and so we need a watered-down version that makes us feel better about ourselves. And I say, how about we don't monkey around with the Bible, just leave it alone, and, uh, and instead of trying to change the Bible, let's let the Bible change us. And, uh, and so we're going to do that this morning. We're going to agree to just kind of meet at the book this morning, and, uh, and I think the Lord will bless that today. In Genesis, in chapter number three, and let me, let me say this, uh, I, I put this in our, our bulletin a long time ago. In fact, I brought this up from Homestead. I wrote this a while back, and, uh, and I said, I need to start putting this in the bulletin so people understand, because I'd have people meet me at the door and say, why do you preach like that? And, uh, and I say, well, maybe I just need a disclaimer. And so I don't know if you've ever taken the time to read the preaching disclaimer, but I'm going to read it to you in the back of the bulletin. It says this, at Flagler County Baptist Church, we make no apologies for strong preaching. We will preach the Bible, meaning the whole counsel of God. We will not tiptoe or or omit anything based upon who may be sitting in the crowd. The only one who reserves the right to influence the preaching is the Holy Ghost himself. Psalms 119, 165, great peace of they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Then I wrote this, if I offend you, then I've done wrong. 
If the Bible offends you, then you've done wrong. And so this morning, with that thought in mind, I'm going to preach the Bible. Now, it's not going to be like a normal message where I'm very charismatic and I'm all over the place trying to keep your attention and everything. I I want to just teach you a few things today. And uh, we're going to let the Bible shape our philosophy of life. And uh, and that's the way it should be. Your, Your philosophy of this life ought to come from your theology. Your theology ought to come from the Bible, not from some preacher or some teacher, from the Bible. And, uh, and may God help us with that. In Genesis chapter number three, we're just going to read verse number 20. It's our custom to stand together for the reading of the word of God and out of respect for the Bible. So let's stand together. Genesis chapter number three. And I'm only going to read verse number 20. So because of that, I'd like for you to read with me. If you're standing there this morning with the King James Bible in your hand, would you help me read Genesis three twenty together out loud? One, two, three, go. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Father in heaven, I love you, and I pray now that you'll bless the preaching of your word. I pray for John Paul today with the kidney issues, and Father, that they'll be able to take care of that very soon. I pray for Alberto and his family, dear Lord, that you'll be with them and help them during this time. Do what you need to do there, Lord. We're just trusting you for it. And Father, we pray for Pastor Doug Fisher and the church and that body there. I pray, dear Lord, that you'll uh, be with him and his family and his church family during this time. Then, Father, today we ask you, dear Lord, for uh, 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 Christine, I believe her name is, uh, Father, we've been praying for. And uh, thankful, Lord, what a blessing for her to to have a a heart transplant, and she's doing okay. Oh, Lord, I thank you for that. I pray, that, dear Lord, that you'll be with with Venny and Caroline and and help them as they're trying to uh, be a blessing to their their family and their daughter-in-law and their son and all those. And may, may the Lord Jesus Christ be honored in that. That's a miracle. Amen. We thank you for it. Father, bless now the preaching of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for standing. You may be seated. I believe it was Gypsy Smith who said, if we're ever going to beat the devil, we're going to have to beat him with a cradle. And, uh, and I say, well, if you're going to beat the devil with something, you may as well beat him with a cradle. And uh, you say, what does that mean? It really means about the same thing as the person who said, the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. And uh, it's a a way of saying that the influence of a mother can change the entire world. There's something about the influence of a mother. Lord Shaftesbury, a great humanitarian in England, said these words, give me a generation of Christian mothers And I will undertake to change the face of English society in 12 months. He said, all I need is one generation of Christian mothers who live for the Lord. And I can change the whole country. Oh, my. And that's something. The importance of motherhood. In fact, it's no wonder that motherhood is at God's uh, list, uh, the top of God's list of importance. Motherhood is an office appointed from God. There are no accidents. It's an office appointed from God. And that's why motherhood is such a huge responsibility and ought to be taken very, very seriously. And uh, uh, there are many mothers in the Bible, and and we can learn from them. Let me ask you this question this morning. How many in here this morning, you would say, you know, uh, I, I learned some valuable life lessons from my mother. Now, it may be I learned what not to do. And it may be I learned what to do. But either way, I learned some valuable life lessons from my mother. I wonder how many people could raise your hand. I'm trying to see if someone doesn't raise their hand. That's pretty much everybody in the room. It's an agreement that, hey, I learned some lessons from mama that have shaped my life. Valuable lessons. Now, If you learn lessons from mama that have helped you in your life, then friend, let me tell you something. This book that we call the Bible, what a valuable resource. It is chock filled with mothers. And we can learn some valuable lessons just as you learned from your mother. We can learn some valuable lessons from mothers in the Bible. And so with the Lord's help this morning, and now that I've already preached this in the 830 service, I know how long it takes to preach this message. So I really got to preach fast and you listen fast. And uh, I'm going to have to skip some things like I did in the 830 and that's going to be fine. But let me show you some mothers from the Bible. And let us this morning take some valuable lessons from these mothers of the Bible of the Bible and and see if they can help shape our lives from this day going forward. Uh, The first mother we'll look at is the obvious one, Eve. 
The Bible calls her the mother of all living. But the lesson we're going to learn from Eve right off the top is this. Eve, the deceived mother. The deceived mother. Now, I told you a moment ago, you learned from your mother valuable life lessons. And I said, some of you, maybe you could say, I learned what not to do. And some of you, I learned what to do. And probably all of us are in some of those categories this morning. And with Eve, we're going to learn this morning, certainly this lesson, what not to do. Eve was a deceived mother. Most everybody knows the story of Eve in the Garden of Eden there. And, uh, and she had that confrontation with the serpent, the devil, Lucifer, uh, Satan. And he singled her out when she was not under, under the protection of her protector. When the devil went after Eve, he did it when she was vulnerable. He did it when she was out from underneath the protection of her protector. Her protector is, was her husband. Now, she willingly chose to allow herself to be out from under the protection of her husband, meaning that when she was confronted by the devil uh, with that first conversation, she should have said, one moment, let me get my husband. Uh, I don't want to speak to you about this. Uh, I, don't, I don't agree with what you're saying. I don't understand what you're saying. Let me go get my husband. Now, let me do this this morning. Remember how we started the whole thing off? We said we're going to be people of the book. We're Bible believers. We're biblicists. We believe the word of God. Now, I understand we live in 2021, and I understand there are philosophies of this world. But the, my philosophy and your philosophy should not be this world's philosophy. Our philosophies come from our theology, and our theology comes from the Bible. We're people of the book. And so we're going to believe the Bible, and we're not going to apologize for it. We're not going to apologize when the Bible says something or kind of make a joke about it or tiptoe around it or whatever. Let's just hit it head on. I think we'll all be better off for it if we just let God be God and not be afraid to preach the word of God no matter what the year is or what the culture looks like around us. And so with that being said, I want you to turn in your Bible, if you would, please, to the book of Ephesians. Would you go to the New Testament, please? The book of Ephesians. Eve was a deceived mother. How did this happen? She, she, she made choices while she was out from underneath the protection of her protector. Now, Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse number 22. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now you come to that portion of Scripture, and, and a lot of times today in 2021, preachers will absolutely avoid that Scripture like, like that Scripture has coronavirus. I mean to tell you, they put on their hazmat suits, and they stay far away from that portion of Scripture today. And then if by chance they happen to have to stumble upon it, then you'll find them kind of joking it off. You know, <laughs> you know can I get an amen? You know, <laughs> and they just kind of move on. And I say, you know, I don't know why we're so afraid of the Bible. I don't think that it's the Bible we're afraid of. I think it's the people listening that we're afraid of. That's the problem. How about we just let God be God and just preach the word of God? Now, here's the deal. When you read the Word of God, here's something you need to know about the Bible. The Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration means the very breath of God. That means what I just read to you, if it's part of the canon of Scripture, and we know that it is, means it came from the very breath of God. God breathed it, and it happened to be the Apostle Paul who wrote it down. Uh, Paul's not the writer. God's the writer. All Scripture, the Bible says, is given by inspiration. You look up that word inspiration, it means God's breath. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it says, and is profitable for doctrine. Every bit of Scripture came from the mouth of God, and the Bible says it's profitable for doctrine. It does not matter uh, what, what age you live in. Now we have uh, today uh, people who like to say, well, that particular portion of scripture that was given for a particular time period and a particular culture of people, and that's not really for us today. That was given to a private interpretation. 
And I say, well, friend, the Bible is very clear that the scripture is not given to any private interpretation and that it is all profitable. And so you cannot take one portion of scripture that you do not agree with or that you do not like because it does not fit your, your, your mindset or your philosophy and say, well, for that one, that one I'm going to toss out. That was for that people group for that time period. But I sure do love John 3, 16. That one's for me. I'll take that one, but I don't want to take this one over here. And so you get to pick and choose what parts of the Bible you're going to believe and adapt your life to and what parts you're going to throw out the window. At the end of the day, then, who is God? You or him? If you're the one determining what the word of God is. How about even if the Bible goes against culture, even if the Bible hair lips the devil and all of his followers, how about we just follow the book and be people of the book? And so as we read a portion of scripture like that where it says, wives, submit yourselves, and we find out that word submit means to stay under control and authority. Wives, put yourself under the authority of your husbands. That's what that Bible says. Somebody says, I don't like that at all. And I said, well, I told you a moment ago, if the Bible offends you, then you've done wrong. You know, so take it up with the Lord. We're just going to preach the Bible this morning. This was the problem with Eve. You know, she allowed herself to, 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 to not run right to the protector and, and, and put herself under his authority to take care of this particular problem. Uh, submission, uh, friend, when submission to the husband is not present, the wife is opening up herself for an attack from the devil. No doubt about it. Now, can I show you something? Most of the time when somebody preaches this, that, that, uh, that wives submit yourselves uh, under your husbands as under the Lord, uh, Somebody looks at that and says, well, there, there's a chauvinist preacher for you. There's someone who thinks that men hold more value than women hold and all this stuff. Can I debunk all of that for just a moment using the Bible? Let me show you something. Can I uh, take your Bible and look with me, please, at 1 Corinthians. So you're in Ephesians. Go back, if you would, to 1 Corinthians and look with me at chapter number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. Somebody says, I can't believe there's somebody still preaching this way in 2021. There's a few of us dinosaurs out there still existing, still preaching. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 3. The Bible says this. It says, but I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of every woman, and the head of the woman, I'm sorry, is the man. Now, let me stop there for a minute. Let me ask you a question. Can you look up here for just a moment? We're going to finish that verse. But how many would say this? You would say, I believe that Jesus Christ is God. How many would say that? Amen. That's good. How many say, I believe Jesus Christ is God, co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent. Jesus is Lord. Do you believe that? Amen. All right. Now let's keep reading this verse. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 3. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is is God. Now you just raised your hand and you just said that you believe that, that Jesus was co-equal with God. And I just showed you in this verse of scripture here that the Bible says, uh, and the head of Christ is God, the Father. And so you say, my, what are we going to do with this problem? This seems like it's presented itself. I like when you find a problem in the Bible because the Bible has all the answers, doesn't it? Now, in order to answer this, this problem that you have, where you say, well, hold on a minute. You just told me we just all agreed that Jesus was co-equal with God. And now the Bible says that, 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 that God is the head of Christ. And, and so what are we going to do with, with this portion of Scripture? Go to the book of Philippians. You're in 1 Corinthians, right? 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, the book of Philippians. Philippians in chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number 2. We're going to answer this question. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Chapter 2 and verse number 5. Who being, now you need to look at verse number 6 now, because we're going to answer this question right here. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. All right, that, that made you feel a little better, didn't it? You say, because that's what I believe. I believe that Jesus is God, co-equal. Jesus is the Father, and co-equal here. And it says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, in verse 7, but made himself, here it is, of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, listen to this, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death 
of the cross. The Bible says that Jesus was equal with the Father, but He chose, even though he, there was equality, He chose to become obedient even unto death. Aren't you thankful for that? Amen. For all of, all of the, the, the history of mankind, whenever, whenever someone's time was to die, because we know the Bible says in Hebrews 9.27, as appointed unto men once to die, after this the judgment, everybody has an appointment to meet with death. By the way, that appointment's with or without COVID. You're going to go when God wants you to go. That's the truth, no matter what you want to believe. Uh, someone's scared to death. I, I, I saw one lady the other day. Uh, she just got her, her shot. And she was in Publix, and she was staying so far from me, and she was paranoid out of her mind. And, and I'm like, you can come. She, no, 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 no. Go ahead. And all this stuff. I'm like, what are you so afraid of? People are so afraid of dying. Can I tell you something? You're not ready to live until you're ready to die. You need to know that. I mean, to tell you, what life are you living when you're that scared, you know, for crying out loud? Are you trusting the Lord or not, you know? But anyways, we look at this thing. We have an appointment. We have an appointment. And so for all of this, the, the, the time of mankind here on earth, death would be summoned by God. And he would say, it's this person's appointed time because we know that the Bible is very clear. Job said this. Job said, uh, the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. You mark that down. The devil doesn't have the power to take somebody's life. People say, well, the devil took somebody so-and-so's life. The devil doesn't have that kind of power. Please don't give him that kind of power. You give the devil that kind of power, and I'm not going to make it to sunset. You think he's going to let a Bible preacher live that long? Not going to happen. You're going to die too. He doesn't have the power to take our lives. Only God has that kind of power. Right? So the Bible says the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. And by the way, that's a good verse of scripture to help anybody who's dealing with the loss of a loved one. Oftentimes, all we focus on is that the Lord has taken away and we get our hearts broken and, all, and we can become angry at God. And I say, you better remember that that time that you enjoyed with that person was a gift from God because the Bible says the Lord gave. The Lord gave. And you would have never known that person had God not given them to you. You would have never enjoyed that person, got to love that person, or fall in love with that person, had God not given them to you. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. And what does the rest of the verse say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. So in all this time here on earth, uh, when it was somebody's appointed time, the Lord would say, summon death. And death would come to the Lord, and he'd say, all right, go get him. It's this person's time. But there came a time 2,000 years ago where the Lord Jesus Christ was on the cross of Calvary, and death came to the Lord, and death said, it's your turn. And the Bible says that he became obedient unto death. Death was always obedient unto him. But for the first time, he became obedient unto death. Isn't that interesting? How did that happen? He submitted himself. He became submissive. Now, would you listen to me closely? When there is submission, there is harmony with no loss of dignity. When there is submission, there is harmony with no loss of dignity. Somebody says, well, you, you believe that you know, men are worth more than women because the woman's supposed to put herself under the authority of the man, and so women have a higher value. I say, well, you better know what the Bible says. Go to the book of Galatians. Where are we at? Philippians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Go backwards. Here's what the Bible has to say about that. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 28. The Bible says in Galatians 3, 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Hear what he said? He said, you're all one in Christ Jesus. You are equal in love. You are equal in value. You are equal in standing before God. No inequality. You know, well, I believe in equality of women, and you must believe in inequality. Excuse me, I just said to you, your Bible just said that you are equal in love, you are equal in standing. Man, I tell you what, you, you, were, you, were, you were equal uh, here, it, it said there, uh, you, you were equal, uh, what verse are we at? Uh, verse number 328, let me read it again. There's neither junior, for you are one in Christ Jesus. No difference. You're the same. You're equal in value. Isn't this very interesting? When, friend, there is submission, there is harmony with no loss of dignity. Doesn't mean you're of lesser value. It just means we're harmonious. 
Now, we enjoy music. A moment ago, you just heard a quartet singing. And what the quartet sang was that song, Grace. And you had a soprano line, an alto line, a tenor line, and a bass line. And for a moment in that song, the piano left us. And we sang a cappella. And we enjoyed soprano, alto, tenor, and bass all together. Now, whenever we sing in a group, there'll be times where I'll say to Brother Jeremy, I'll say, Brother Jeremy, when we're practicing a new song, or sometimes even an old song, I'll say, Brother Jeremy, I said, what part do you want me to sing? Because I can sing the tenor, I can sing them all if I want. But I'll say, Brother Jeremy, what, what part do you want me to sing? And uh, you want me to sing uh, lead or tenor? Those are usually my two choices. And most of the time, Brother Jeremy says, Pastor, I want you to sing lead in this song. Now, I didn't say soprano. I said lead. Isn't that interesting, though, how soprano line is synonymous with the lead line? Now, we have those notes somebody will sing and, you know... You got your harmony there. Soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. Somebody has to take the lead. Because if all we had was the alto, tenor, and bass, that song wouldn't sound good. Wouldn't sound good at all. Someone has to take the lead. And guess what? The alto can't outshine the lead. Nor can the tenor, nor can the bass. If the song's going to sound right. They're there actually supporting the lead. But it, all of them are of equal importance, you know. It's very important. If you're going to have harmony, you can't be missing any of them. And that's the way that it goes here uh, with the Word of God. Uh, and so here's the problem with Eve. We find that Eve was deceived. She was deceived about her authority. She was deceived about the Word of God. Would you do me a favor and go back uh, in our text to the book of Genesis, uh, the book of Genesis in chapter number 3? Uh, Eve was deceived about the word of God. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 1, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said unto the woman, notice these words now, Yea, hath God said. I underline that in my Bible. Yea, hath God said. What is he doing right here? He is questioning the word of God. Did God really say this? Are you sure God said this? He's questioning the word of God. Are you sure that that's the word of God? You know what I've heard people say to me before? They say, well, I don't really pay much attention to Paul's epistles. And they roll their eyes. I don't, I don't pay much attention to Paul's epistles. Just tell me what Jesus said. You know, I've had people tell me that. You know, and, and you, you, you know, sometimes you're, you're talking or preaching or whatever uh, on a particular subject. And, uh, and they say, well, no, I don't really care what Paul had to say. Just what did Jesus say? And I say, you know, you don't build a doctrine upon what Jesus did not say. And sometimes they'll say, Jesus never spoke on that subject. You know, Jesus never, never, never touched on that subject. And I say, well, the book of John ends by saying the things that Jesus did are so much you can't even contain them in a book. And so you can't look at what Jesus did not say or what you suppose he didn't say uh, based upon the fact that God did not allow it to be captured as part of the canon of Scripture and build a doctrine upon it and say, therefore, you know, for example, the one I'm thinking of in particular, someone was talking to me about uh, the sin of homosexuality and transgender and all that. And they said, oh, but what did Jesus say about it? I don't care what Paul had to say. What did Jesus say? I say, well, just because Jesus didn't come right out and say he's against it in the Gospels, you're going to assume that he's okay with it? When there's a lot of scripture that says otherwise? Well, I don't care what Paul has to say. It doesn't work that way. It's the word of God. And so what we find here in Genesis chapter 3 is Satan says these, Hath God said? What's he doing? He's questioning the validity of the word of God. He's saying, uh, you, mean, you, really, you really think God? I don't think God said that. I don't know that I believe that part. Be careful questioning the Bible. The Lord made no bones about it. He ended the book by saying, we're not supposed to add to the words in the book of this prophecy. If we add to the words of the book of this prophecy, he will add unto us the plagues that are written therein. And he says, we're not supposed to take away from the words of the book of the prophecy. And if we take away from the words of the book of the prophecy, he will take away our name out of the book of life. He said, don't touch the Bible. He really meant it. 
Be careful in touching the Bible. Just believe. It's the Word of God. All 66 books, 39 of the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, 40 different writers over a period of 1,500 years without one contradiction. Friend, that's the Word of God. Let's just let God be God. Let all men be liars and trust the Word of God. But here's the problem. He said, hath God said. Then verse number two. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it. Notice this part. Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Quickly look at chapter two, verse 17. It says, but the tree, this is God speaking here in 217. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Eve misquoted the Bible. God didn't say you couldn't touch it. He said, don't eat of it. And Eve went along and she said, well, you can't eat of it and you can't touch it or you're going to die. Now what do we find? We find changing the word of God. So we went from questioning the word of God to now we're changing the Bible. Changing the Bible. Oh, friend, this is, this is a whole heap of trouble. This lesson we're learning from Eve here. Uh, don't touch the Bible. Don't change the Bible. It, it's okay. The Bible, does, if it, you ever hear that old phrase, grandma used to say it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Remember that one? If it ain't, friend, pardon my English, it ain't broke. It didn't need fixing. It doesn't need Zondervan. It doesn't need, it doesn't need Nelson. It doesn't need Westcott and Hort. It doesn't need changing. It's the perfect word of God. The problem is not changing the Bible. The problem is let the Bible change you. That's what we have a problem with. But anyway, so you see, there's that one. And then look at verse number four. Verse number four says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. So we went from questioning the Bible uh, to, to changing the Bible. And then the devil says, Ye shall not surely die. Now he's all out denying the Bible. Now he's just denying the Bible completely. That's not the word of God. <coughs> You're not going to die if you touch that fruit, if you eat that fruit. You're not going to surely die. The Word of God is not really the Word of God. The Bible's not the Word of God. It's not really inspired. It's not the Word of God. You're not going to die. Don't trust God. That's what you have here. Oh, isn't that a slippery slope when you start questioning the Bible and it leads to changing the Bible, which ultimately leads to denying the Bible. And oh, do we see that today? We see, we see Christians, so-called, who are denying that the Bible is the Word of God. Oh, you see it today. And where does it start? It starts all the way back with questioning the Bible. Let's just let God be God, you know? Eve was deceived. She was deceived about the Word of God. She was deceived about the sovereignty of God. He caused her to believe that God might be wrong in His demands on them. He, he caused her to believe that, that, that God is wrong. You're not going to die. There's no way that's going to happen. He was making her uh, believe in uh, the sovereignty of God was not reality. And then she was also deceived concerning the wrath of God. He deceived her into thinking that God would not carry out his promise of death. He said, you're not going to surely die. I don't, don't believe that. You're not going to die. Are you sure you want to believe that? The reality of the Bible... You're, you're as foolish as Eve is if you believe that God will not carry out what he said he'll do. When God said these words, the soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. You mark it down. He will carry out what he said. When God said, for the wages of sin is death, you can mark it down. The wages of sin is death. You know, uh, the Bible's very clear. And, uh, and the devil can, can make people question and, and, and people will say, well, I don't, I don't know that I necessarily believe that, that, that a loving God would send somebody to hell. I don't believe that. And I say, well, then you're saying you don't believe the Bible. And let me just explain this. You're right. A loving God wouldn't send somebody to hell, but a just God would. And that, that God that we find from the word of God is a just God. But you better thank God that his justice and his mercy met one day because he's also a loving God. And that God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he says, I don't believe a loving God would send somebody to hell and they want to question the love of God. I say, you can't question the love of God while looking at Calvary. That's impossible. 
when you see the only sinless one bleeding and dying for the sins of mankind. There's, it's impossible. But anyways, you see, you see Eve. Oh, Eve, what a, what a, what a picture of a, of a deceived mother, a deceived mother. Uh, another one real quick, and I just have to give you the rest of them. I, I, this is what happened in the morning service. I preached one. I didn't get to preach the rest, so I'm just going to give you the rest of them. Sarah was a carnal mother, a carnal mother. Oh, Sarah, uh, you're in Genesis real quick. Look at chapter 12 real quick. I'm just going to give it to you. Chapter 12 and verse number 1. The Bible says, now the Lord had said unto Abraham, this is what's called the Abrahamic covenant, uh, the, 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 the covenant that God made with Abraham. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee and I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God made a promise to Abraham. He said, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. I am going to give you a great nation from you. God had given that promise to Abraham. When God says something and he promises something, you can mark it down. God's going to follow through. Now, here's the problem. Uh, Abraham's wife, Sarah, didn't believe God. And so in chapter 16, turn over a couple pages, chapter 16 and verse number one. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had in handmaid an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid, if, if it may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened unto the voice of Sarah. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, to, uh, to uh, the Egyptian, I'm sorry, after Abram, and dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave to her uh, to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. Oh my, what a problem. Very important principle here. She was unwilling to wait upon the Lord. And look what she ultimately did. Chapter 18, verse number 9. Chapter 18 and verse number 9. The Bible says, and they said, un and they said unto him, Where is Sarah, thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. So Sarah's listening to Abraham talking to the angel of the Lord. She's kind of eavesdropping. She's got that ear up on the door and that cup on it, you know, and trying to eavesdrop here on this conversation. And she hears this, this conversation. Sarah's going to have a wife. Verse 11. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women, meaning that her normal cycles that a woman would have in order to allow her to be able to have a baby, she was no longer having those cycles, those physical cycles. Verse 12, therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, after I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return to thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. God said, I already appointed a time. I'm still going to come when I appointed a time, but you got ahead of me. You got ahead of me, and you were thinking carnally. I promised Abraham I was going to make a great nation, which meant that I was going to take care of things. But you took matters in your own hand and you took your handmaid and you gave your handmaid to your husband. And Sarah, you were willing to give up your morals to get what you wanted. You took your own morals and threw them out the window to get what you wanted, Sarah. Oh, friend, let me tell you about Sarah. She was a carnal mother, a carnal mother. She gave Hagar to bear a son with Abraham. She didn't wait on God. She took matters out of God's hand and put them in her own power. And when that happens, friend, mark it down. Only trouble and sorrow will result. When you get ahead of God 
And you try to take matters in your own hands and you can't learn the lesson to wait on the Lord and be of good courage. Be still and know that I am God. When you don't wait on God and you get ahead of God in your life, friend, I'll tell you what's going to happen. And you already know it to be true. It's only going to result in troubles and sorrows and more troubles and more sorrows as people don't wait on God. How many of us in here today know people that way? They know that God has expectations of them in their life. But instead of listening to God, listening to the Bible, listening to a godly mom and a godly dad, listening to a godly pastor, listening to a godly church, they decide, I'm going to do things my way. Anybody in this room who grew up in church and maybe you grew up in a youth group as young people, you can start thinking about those people who were also in the youth group with you growing up. And you could have a hard time like I do trying to think of the ones that are actually serving God today. What happened? They took things in their own hands. They got ahead of God. They didn't learn to wait on the Lord. And when that happens, friend, only trouble and sorrow will result. And here's what happens. They wind up with so many heartaches in their life, so many troubles. The, the, if they look back on the road that they have taken, it is littered, littered with trouble, littered with trials. Why? Because it's littered with bad choices. Because we thought we knew better than mom. We thought we knew better than dad. We thought we knew better than the Bible. We thought we knew better than the church and the preacher. And so we said, you know what? I, I can do things. And we take matters in our own hands. And we live a carnal life. And as a result, we look back. And here's what they do. They, they look back and they say, this life is so cruel. This life is just such a hard life. Uh, I don't know that I'd want to ever raise a baby in this world. This life is so cruel. This life is so hard. And, and you say, well, hold on a minute. It wouldn't have been so. All of us are going to have troubles, yes. But it wouldn't have been so bad had you just listened and not got ahead of God and stopped thinking carnally and try to th take matters into your own hands. Because of her carnality, her thinking was absolutely irrational. And that's what happens. You can preach so you're blue in the face. People make irrational choice after irrational choice. You say, why would you do that? Can't you not learn? <laughs> Can't you learn? Why would you do it again? You know, I mean, to tell you, someone will say, you know, preacher, I was in this abusive relationship and, 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 and with this guy, but I'm, I'm moving on and I'm done and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change. My, and then they say, preacher, I want to introduce you to somebody. And the guy walks in and you're like, he's a poster child for abuse. He's going to love me. That other guy was horrible, but this guy here, he's, he's a lot better. And I say, my goodness. They do it again and again and again. When are you going to stop and just wait on the Lord and let God make the choices and trust the Lord instead of being like Sarah, being carnally minded? Real quick, carnality never thinks in behalf of God. It only thinks of self. Carnality always opposes God. Carnality will always laugh at God. Carnality laughs at God. Carnality will always exalt self-will above God's will. Carnality will always attempt to overrule God's plan. You know, you have today pastors and churches, uh, you know, pastors that will take their churches and they will send their, 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 their church to go lie with Hagar, in other, for lack of better terminology, you know, the Hagar of worldliness, because they don't want to wait on the Lord. And they say, well, I'm just going to, and then they laugh. They laugh, you know. Send, send their church to go lie with Hagar of the world because they don't want to wait on the Lord, you know? And they look at a church and they say, you guys, are you guys seriously in 2021 still using the King James Bible? <laughs> and they laugh. I, I, are you serious? They asked me to pick up a hymn book? People, do they still make these? They laugh, you know? I mean, you're still preaching it, that, that, that women are supposed to submit themselves unto their own husbands? And they laugh. And you say, yeah. Some of us are just waiting on the Lord. Some of us are okay with just waiting on God. We don't have to try to get ahead of God. And try to say, well, you know, I want, I want to have the biggest ministry on the planet. And so if I'm going to do that, I, there's no way I can preach on some of these verses. There's no way I got I to gotta, you know, sing these old hymns that bless grandma's heart, but they can't bless, bless today. We got we to gotta appeal to the flesh, you know. We got to keep, we got we to gotta do all, we, we got we to gotta send the church to go lie with Hagar so that we can get what we want and get it our way. 
We're going to laugh at anybody else who does anything different. I say, well, that's all right. You can laugh all you want, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to wait on the Lord and be of good courage because I know how the whole thing ends. And if we choose to just wait on God, God, God will bless. Oh, friend, he will definitely bless. I'm not even the least bit worried about it. God's already blessing our church. It's amazing what God's doing here. Let me tell you about another one. I'm just going to give it to you. Hannah. Hannah was a godly mother. Hannah was the same as Sarah. She couldn't have a child. And so Hannah, Hannah goes uh, to the Lord and she cries and she begs God. And, and they thought she was a drunk woman the way she was crying out to God. And, uh, and God heard her prayer. God answered her prayer. And God gave her a child. Oh my, she's going to have baby Samuel. And Hannah said, I'm going to give this baby to the Lord God. If you give me a baby, I'll give him back to you. Hannah is a picture of a godly mother. She said, this child child here is your child, God. This is not mine. This child yours. And I'm giving them right back to you. What a godly mother. Then there came a time where Elkanah was going to go to Jerusalem to the temple like everybody else. Elkanah being her husband, he was going to go to Jerusalem like everybody else. And he said, honey, are you ready to go? And Hannah said, I'm going to stay behind if you don't mind, honey, uh, because uh, I'm not going to go anywhere until this baby's been weaned. Uh, I want to take care of this baby. Now, don't you know that Hannah wanted so badly in her own heart to go to Jerusalem? Why not? It would be a great big reunion there. Everybody would be there. Uh, and, and you know how it goes when you haven't seen somebody for a long time and you show up there and they look at your children and they say, my goodness, haven't you got so big? And look at that. You got your mother's eyes, man. You're going to be big and strong like your daddy. What a chip off the old block. Don't you know that Hannah probably wanted nothing more than to go down to Jerusalem to that great big old reunion and show off what God had done and show off this baby. But she said, no, uh, I'm going to put this baby baby first and take care of this baby first and make sure I nurture this baby. I'm not going anywhere until this baby has been weaned. What a picture of a godly mother. She said, listen, this child after God and after my husband, this child comes next and I'm going to take care of this baby and I'm going to put this child first. And hey, what a novel idea, a mother taking care of her child. What a novel idea. You know, children are not supposed to be inconveniences. I got a career to think about. This baby's in my way. This child's in my way. I'm trying to do something here. I got a career. Here, you, you, you raise, here, take this and, and raise, raise this, this child. It's not supposed to be that way. Godly mother looks at her child and says, that's a gift from God and I'm giving him back to the Lord. Oh, you have Jochebed. Jochebed took her little boy Moses and she took that baby and she, she put him in, a, in an ark one day, a little, little boat she had made, she had fashioned together and she put that ark in the Nile and she shoved it out there. You say, why would she do such a thing? Because the Pharaoh said that every single man child that was an Israelite was supposed to be killed. They were supposed to take those beautiful little babies and they were supposed to walk to the Nile and they were supposed to toss their baby out to the Nile and let the crocodiles come eat their baby. Oh, now listen, uh, years ago I had some preachers come visit me in Homestead and I, I took them to the alligator farm and in Homestead, Florida there in the Everglades and they had this exhibit where they had uh, Nile crocodiles. Now, I've seen all kinds of reptilian in my life. And just the other day, we were in the Everglades last week, actually, uh, just a few days ago. And uh, we went to the Everglades National uh, Park there in the middle of the night. And um, we were looking at alligators. My wife had this idea that we would go out there and take our flashlights. We've done it before, and it's a lot of fun. The kids love it. And we used to take teen groups out to do it. And you put a flashlight by your head, and you go in the middle of the Everglades, and you scan across the water, and you see these red eyes everywhere. At this one lake, when we were doing this, we saw seven alligators all at once sitting out there. You got to go on the Anhinga Trail at nighttime. It's a lot of fun. And, uh, and, and you're looking at all these alligators, you know, and, uh, and, and, and so we're looking at them. And then my boy Silas, he goes, hey, daddy, he says, can I call him up here? And I said, well, go ahead, son. And I taught my kids how to do alligator calls, you know, and uh, I was raised here. And, uh, and so my little boy Silas, he goes, oh, 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 oh. And then before you knew it, all of those alligators came. And one of them was coming so fast. I kid you not. I mean like fast, 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 fast. And he was just coming across that water. And I'm like, well, good job, son. And I'm like, uh, I said, and he was coming so fast that I said, everybody step back. Get back. I'm serious. And uh, I said, they can leap their body length out of the water. I said, we're backing up here. I thought he was, I thought he was coming to bite somebody. I mean, that's how fast he came. You know, alligators are interesting creatures. They're, they're, they're kind of scary. But have you ever seen a Nile crocodile? They're different. 
they're a whole nother level. Alligators, they are what they are. But man, when I saw those Nile crocodiles, I stood there for a moment and I'm looking at them in this pit with those preachers and they were talking over here and I was just looking and my mind instantly went back to old, old Jochebed having to take her baby and put him in, the, in that Nile and what she must have been thinking. And I'm looking at those. The, I mean, they look wicked. They look absolutely wicked. They look evil. These, these Nile crocodiles, they're all, like I said, they're insanely wicked looking. And I'm looking at these Nile and I'm thinking, man, what must have Jochebed been thinking? But what she had to do one day, she couldn't just keep hiding a baby in the house because ultimately somebody would have heard the baby crying. They would have run into the house. They would have found that it was a man child and they didn't kill the man child, sacrifice the man child to, their Pharaoh, uh, to the Pharaoh's gods. And they would have killed everybody in the house. So she had no choice. She said, I got to do something. She took her little baby. She put the baby in a basket and she shoved the baby off. And she said, God, uh, he's in your hands. Uh, I can't do it anymore. There's nothing more I can do, God. I got to trust you with this one. And old Jochebed, she taught us how to be faithful, how to be trusting, how to trust God, how to put something in your basket and leave it with the Lord. Oh, friends, sometimes you got to put children in your basket. Sometimes they're big. Sometimes they're grown with children of their own. And you know they're out of your hands. There's nothing you can do. So you put them in a the basket and you say, God, you're going to have to do something. All of us have things in our lives that there's nothing you can do about it. You can do sulk, cry. If it's out of your hands, what are you going to do? You got to do the same thing you did when you got saved. You trust Jesus. You, 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 didn't, you didn't try to save yourself. You didn't, you didn't get out there and start wading through the crocodiles and start paddling your way through and say, I'm going to save myself here. I'm going to take care. I'm going to get myself all the way to heaven. You didn't do that. No. You said, Lord, you got to save me. you got to save me. I read something this morning. It made me laugh. I'll have to be done here. But a man was in Australia, and they had all the crocodiles out there, and he's standing up on top of a thing, and, and uh, the man was feeding the crocodiles. And the man that was doing the demonstration that owned the, the crocodile farm, he said to all the people there, he said, now listen, he said, if anybody here is crazy enough to jump in that water with all them crocodiles and swim from here all the way to shore, I'll give them a million dollars. And, uh, and he said, what, no takers? All of a sudden, a man, and I mean that man swimming as fast as he could. He was swimming. Those, those crocodiles, man, they were fast on his tail, but this man swam like there was no tomorrow. He got up on the other side of the beach, and, and uh, man, he, he jumped over that fence, and he's breathing heavy and everything. And that man that owned the crocodile farm, he's like, well, that's never happened before. And, uh, and well, I guess I better honor it. You know, he gives the man the prize, and he says, man, he says, I can't believe you did that. He said, I've never, I've told people that, and he says, I've never had anybody jump in like that. And he says, well, I didn't jump in, I was pushed in. And he turned and he looked at his wife, and she smiles. <laughs> and the old saying is, behind every good man is a great wife who pushes him to success. Well, friend, Jochebed was a trusting mother. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a rejoicing mother. Why did Mary rejoice? She rejoiced because salvation could be brought to all of mankind and what God was going to do through her life. There's some lessons from some ladies in the Bible that we can learn. And to all make it, there's some that are what not to do. Don't be a deceived mother. Don't be a deceived, don't be a carnal mother. Oh, but be a trusting mother. Be a joyful, rejoicing, a rejoicing mother. Let's pray. Father, how we love you, and thank you for your many, many blessings in our lives. Dear Lord, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you that it's the Word of God. And we thank you, dear Lord, we don't have to apologize for just preaching the Bible. And uh, we understand that the Bible is offensive. It, it offends people who aren't living by it. You know, it offends people who, who don't believe it. But Father, for those who love you and love the Word, to them it's precious. To them, it's food. It's necessary. And Father, we thank you for the word of God and how you feed us through it and help us to live this Christian life. Father, we just pray that you'll bless in the invitation time. Speak to the hearts of people. Thank you so much for what you do. Let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed for just a moment. I wonder who would say this morning, Preacher, I remember when I was born again. I know that I'm saved. I've trusted Christ as Savior. I remember that event in my life when I got saved. 
I wonder who could raise your hand with mine and say, that's me. God bless you. Thank you so much. You may put your hands down. I wonder who here this morning would say, preacher, let me be honest with you. I don't know for sure that I am born again. I, I hope I'm saved. What, this language you're, you're using, going to have eternal life, going to live in heaven with Jesus. I hope I'm going to heaven one day. But I'm going to be honest with you. Between me, you, and God, I understand that nobody else is looking around. So between me, you, and God, I'm not sure that I'm saved. I hope I'm saved, but I don't know for sure that I'm saved. I wonder who here this morning would simply raise your hand and put it right back down. I will not call your name or point you out. All I'm going to do is say amen. But you say, pray for me. I'm just not sure that I'm saved. I don't remember ever being born again. If something happened to me and I were to die today, I do not know for sure that I'm going to heaven. Raise your hand big and high and put it right back down. In just a moment, I'm going to give an invitation time. If you don't know Jesus as Savior and you'd like to be saved, I hope you'll come see me during the invitation time and let me take a Bible and show you how you can know for sure. Or really, I'll probably give you to somebody else and let them show you from the Word of God how you can know for sure that heaven is your home. But Christians, friends, and I tell you, when the Lord speaks to our heart, it's a good idea to respond. The Lord gave us a book. He gave us a precious book, the Bible. Let's be people of the book. Even if it goes against our culture, let's be people of the book. Let's determine that we're going to be, we're not going to be like, like Eve, a, a deceived mother. We're not going to be like Sarah, a carnal mother, but more like Hannah, godly, Jochebed, trusting, and Mary, rejoicing. Father, bless the invitation time in Jesus' name. Let's stand together, please. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Brother Jeremy begins to play. Friend, if the Lord spoke to your heart, why don't you step out from where you are right now and let's do business with the Lord. As the piano player plays, friend, the altar is open. It's open for you. There's other folks who are coming. You can come right now. You don't have to wait on anybody. You come and spend some time in prayer. Hey, sometimes we just want to come and thank God for our mother. There are some people in this room who give anything in the world to be able to grab their mom by the hand and walk mama down the aisle and say, Mom, just pray with me. Pray for me. And they could they'd do anything in the world to go back in time and be able to come to an altar and pray with Mama. Oh, friend, take advantage of the times you have. Enjoy it. You have a godly mother. You ought to be so thankful. thank you for how you speak to our hearts. Thank you for the word of God. Bless us now today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being at church today. We're going to sing, we'll never say goodbye in glory and we'll be on our way. If you came prepared to give this morning, the treasure box is there in the back. We call it the storehouse and, uh, and it's there in the back table. You're visiting with us for the first time. I hope you got a visitor's card. Uh, if you didn't, I'll see one of our ushers uh, there in the back and somehow you got overlooked. And, uh, but we'd like to have a record of your visit. I want to send you a letter in the mail thanking you for coming and being a part of the church. You can drop that right into the treasure box there in the back. Let's sing, we'll never say goodbye in glory and then we'll be on our way. Ready? We'll never say goodbye in glory in the morning over yonder. We'll never say goodbye in glory. We'll never say goodbye up there. God bless you. Thank much for being a part of our church service. I hope you enjoyed the message and the music and all that was involved in the church service today. Now listen, something very important is knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you'll visit our website, the web address is www.fcbc.biz. If you go to our website, there's a tab, a drop-down bar, and on it, it says the word salvation. If you'll click on that word salvation, it'll pull up a web page that tells you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. In fact, it tells you how to be born again. That's most important. Everybody needs to know how to be born again. I hope you'll take the time to read through that. And if you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I hope that you'll do that. And listen, if you're ever in the area, we'd love for you to come by and visit with us here at the great Flagler County Baptist Church. Tell everyone about us. God bless you. Thanks for being a part.